Okay, um, I'm very happy to be talking to Michael Lunig today. Uh, Michael is an Australian and for the last 40 years uh, he's been making very popular cartoons which appear regularly in major Australian newspapers. In fact, he's so loved in Australia that he was declared a national living treasure in 1999 by the National Trust. Uh, he's also a writer, a painter, a philosopher and a poet. So, hello, Michael. Hello, John. Thank you. It's, it's very nice to be uh, talking to you. Yeah, yes, you're so far away. I'm, I'm still so old-fashioned that this still makes me all wondrous, you know, the idea that we may communicate like this. <laughs> It's I nice. know, it's, it, it's amazing to me, like I can be sitting in my little studio in Kerry talking to people all around the world. Mm, um, yeah, yeah, thoughts of my Irish great-grandmother come back to me. <laughs> she, oh yeah, where was she, what, what part of Ireland was she from? I really don't know, McManus was her name, Bridget McManus, and mm -hmm. um, I, I wouldn't know, like many Australians, you know, there's, a, a lot, there's often a, a Celtic or Scottish-Irish component, you know, Australians are a bit of everything. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I know, I know she was, a, she was a, a, just a very lively lass, I think. <laughs> That's all I know about her. <laughs> okay, well, um, just to put your work in context for me personally, um, hmm. there, there, there have been times in my life, uh, Michael, dark times, when uh, I felt like the world was like this great weight pressing down on me trying to like squeeze the life out of me and mm. um, in those kind of dark times out of nowhere one of your cartoons uh, would come along and it would it would it would feel like a little note from a, a past to me by a friend uh, you know a little mm. friendly reminder that the world wasn't really what was important that there was mm. uh, like another place like a place that I'd I'd come from and I was trying to get back to or, and mm. it was a place that you seem to be living in <laughs> yes so, I so, hear uh, what uh, you say I, 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 I can relate to this and it's a very a good outcome if that's what has happened yeah well uh, well, like even though all your achievements they're brilliant and they're, they're very impressive and you know well done for them but for me like the achievement that I'm most impressed um, that you for you is that you've managed to survive um, and not just survive but you know send out little notes into the world to help me keep going um, d does that kind of resonate with you it does I think this thing of surviving for an artist to survive to keep uh, being heard or to keep speaking is not easy and to keep your uh, just steadily keep on with it and there's a lot of good fortune in that and there's a lot of uh, uh, seeing the value of it and you you said something about uh, how sort of had a value, the work sometimes had a value for you. I like this idea that work can be useful in a personal way to those who might find it and um, I, I I don't know, it's something utilitarian. I mean, of course, there is art and all that beautiful spiritual mystery of art, which I adore, and I'm, that's part of me. But I also love that that thing can also be actually useful in the way we make sense of our life or are comforted by uh, art or, or given just uh, sort of... It's the spirit of it that is conveyed. And there's, see, I'm not trying to say anything to you or to put something into your mind or into your head. I'm, I'm just hopefully trying to awaken what's in you. And a lot of people don't expect that from a cartoonist. I'm meant to come up with gags and sort of punchlines and cutting kind of commentary on the politics of the day. But I steered away from that. I found the personal realm, the mystery of people's humour, their struggles, their darkness, as you mentioned. Uh, I found this was in just interesting, incredibly interesting, because it's not so much talked about. And I was working for newspapers, you see. So when newspapers are kind of don't look at those things seriously and tend to skim over. So I became fascinated to delve into that and it 
it's not the the normal territory of amusing jokes. Um, so my work became, I guess, poetic. But, but that was odd for me because I, I I was not raised to think of myself as an artist or a poet or a philosopher. And these are titles that have been put upon, uh, sort of attributed to me. I didn't set myself up like that. I was just trying to earn a living, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, I mean, that's how it starts. It's like a musician. You get a gig in a pub and then they ask you to come back and do another one. And so you do. And and, and so it goes. And then one day you wake up and you realize you've got a lot of work out there. Yeah. And it was all just created on the run and to deadlines and in that critical moment of deadline when you can't be too polished. There's a raw kind of quality and a... And a, a, an honesty in that rawness, I guess. There's no time to be too clever. You have to be very direct, but still in that rather mystical space, do you know what I mean, where where poetry arises or the improbable thing, the thing that the public media is neglecting. And, um, and sometimes I think it's what an artist chooses to look at that, it's really interesting. It's, it's it's the direction of their gaze or their interest which becomes very interesting and unique. So I, I found it hard at the start, John. I, I wasn't doing what normal cartoonists were doing, you know, yeah. taking, uh, being satirical and pointing to those ridiculous politicians. Although I did, I, I did a bit of that. I was more interested in our part in all this folly and, you know, uproar and hilarity and the strange thing that life is. I was interested, well, what's my part in this? What's our part, that the ordinary person? What's not being spoken about? What, what can I talk about that I feel is good to talk about openly? So yeah, it's a I, lot of confession in my work, a lot of confession. Mm. I think that's, that's part of why it's so amazing when you that, that your work is in newspapers the last place you'd expect a bit of sweetness and joy <laughs> and, and a bit of truth you know i think that's probably why it's so shocking and so lovely and, and for me had that quality of you know it's like being in a classroom you know with a really oppressive teacher and then somebody passes you a note under the desk that's kind <laughs> of what your cartoons felt like to me anyway of like oh, you know, yeah you. he's an idiot and you know this is what's really important <laughs> you know or yeah, well, or whatever, that, that is a, uh, that's how I saw the traditional role of the cartoonist, well, in this country at least, to be that sort of bit, bit of a uh, the village idiot, the court jester, the one who could sa see and say something that might bring consolation. And often that's a very cheeky thing to do. It's not an educated position necessarily. It's a deeply felt position. And it's subversive in a kindly way, I think. I think I'm, uh, some people think the artist is there to, to rock the boat. And yes, I, I agree with that. But I also think the boat is rocking so wildly in the world now that the artist uh, also is one person who might steady the boat a bit. And um, not to reinforce the values, the conservative, you know, values that are a bit dead, but to steady it with some inspiration or some reassurance that, no, I'm, I'm not going mad. Uh, this guy has passed me a note that tells me that, no, I'm not going mad. It is appalling. That teacher is appalling. And sometimes all I'm saying is very simple things that people are thinking, but it's the public statement of a simple thing that... I think has value because in this great cult of cleverness where so much commentary is very clever, uh, very acerbic and sharp and harsh, um, it silences people. People think, oh, I'm not clever to enter into this. Uh, yeah. So I have to be a little bit open and risky with my sort of foolishness, if you like. Uh, and intuit what I think is worth saying, as you would in a pub or in a, you know, in the public realm between friends. Someone's 
says, oh, come on, let's come to our senses here. You know, these sort of statements sometimes. But, of course, you've got to wrap them up in, in lyrical kind of drawings and make them a bit charming. You have to make them a bit musical, I think. I, th I think there's a musicality in all this too. A lot, of, a lot of things can be carried. Ideas and feelings can be carried on that sort of musical lilt in your, in, in your art. Yeah. Um, I've, heard, um, I've heard you describe your creative process as starting off with a great idea, then everything goes terribly wrong, then panicking, <laughs> then giving up all hope of it all working out, then, then playing in the mess, and then if you're lucky, something wonderful happens. So I thought instead of, like, because normally I kind of do my research, but the person I'm going to have a chat with, and I come up with very, you know, good questions <laughs> and all that. But I thought we might yeah. try that. It, this, instead, yeah. we might try that. We might try and just, you know, go for a bit of a mess and uh, let it all kind of fall apart. Because I heard you giving a talk, uh, I think it was in London, and when it came time for the questions, you asked the audience for questions that they felt might be deeply embarrassing for them to ask. Uh, questions <laughs> like um, like a holy a holy fool might ask, as you as you said. So um, mm -hmm. in that kind of spirit, I've tried to keep my questions to the ones that I'm a bit embarrassed uh, to ask, and uh, feel yes. free uh, to do the same. Yeah, yeah. When something's embarrassing, uh, you know, there's a truth at hand. I think not, not that I set out to embarrass anyone, but I mean, we are all so repressed about the question we really want to ask. We're so so repressed that we can't remember it anymore. Um, there's a certain mode or or a way of. You know, that's sort of everyone wants to look like they're in control and capable and clever and articulate. But sometimes I feel the most important questions are right at the edge of our consciousness. And you, we do fumble there and we need a little time there, a little ill-formed, if you know what I mean. And so, yeah, and that's a messy state to be in uh, somewhat. Uh, but isn't isn't, that, it, it, isn't yeah. it ironic like that when because what we're talking about really is vulnerability and it's, it's yeah. when you see when you see that somebody's vulnerable that's when everybody relaxes and go oh they're just like me oh, I can uh, you know I don't need I don't need <laughs> to keep my pretenses up anymore because they've actually let yeah. theirs down so we, we're, we're just I, the same I, I think so John I think there's a great fear of this vulnerability um uh, because it's a cruel world and there are those who will cut you down quickly and in my area of work I, there's a lot of that. I mean, see, I wasn't educated in, in the normal way like my peer group, my contemporaries were. I never went to university. and In fact, I failed rather badly in my schooling. I enjoyed school but I wasn't good at it and so I grew up thinking I couldn't possibly exist in the environment of you know, articulate, educated people. So that sort yeah. of freed me because I didn't think I had to be that. I could go my own way. Yeah. And, uh, yes, I agree with what you say when someone says something in that kind of naive way, which isn't necessarily stupid, of course. It's just open and to dare to be open is almost... Uh, I mean, we can't be totally open. We can't be totally truthful in this life as as open as possible, as truthful as possible. You know, we've got to survive too. Oh, yeah, like I, 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 I wrote, I wrote mm. down my embarrassing questions in case I forget them. So I didn't, I didn't want to. Be, <laughs> <laughs> you know. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but uh, no, it's a lovely idea that there's an embarrassing question because um, we all need to hear someone else's confession, don't we? And usually, what people are confessing is so humane and human and sweet, really. But we're yeah. not living in a sweet world, it would appear. But we still have a childhood yearning that all shall be well and it's okay to be yourself and unto thine own self be true. All these things they told you when you were a kid, unto thine own self be true. But uh, you later learn that you better watch out if you are true to yourself. So um, one is always trying. Mm. Um, okay, but, so for, first question. Uh, so do um, you have a, you, you actually have a real live question there. Oh, yes, right. We're not just talking oh, theoretically. There is oh, a no, question. Oh, no, I wrote there. them down in okay, case so I completely oh, blanked out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, blanking out is where the fun starts, isn't it? But go ahead, John, go for it. 
Uh, okay, so being a, being a national treasure and, and that kind of thing, and probably because I watched yeah. a lot of interviews with you, do you get tired of people treating you so reverentially? Oh, look, I'm a forgiving kind of guy. Um, and look, there's a lot of hatred. I get so much hatred too. That balances it a bit. Um, because I've been a political cartoonist somewhat and I, you know, we've been through some terrible and we're going through terrible conflicts and violence and war, um, etc., which have been deeply disturbing and sad to me and I've made cartoons and, well, you start making cartoons, public cartoons about that subject and you'll find there's a whole militarist kind of reaction comes from the public. You, there's a lot of darkness out there that one discovers and taps into. I mean, if you're working in the area of the unconscious, which I think a cartoonist sometimes is, then you're going to get a kickback from the unconscious that's out there. Uh, and so, yeah, a lot of hostility, a lot of hostility, a lot of threat, a lot of actual specific threat, malice, uh, spite. Uh, it's It's been hard, I must say. But, so you get to the other thing, reverential, um, look, I sort of understand people try to appreciate or express appreciation. It's a cultural tradition that if if someone has provided something, if it's a singer who's written a lovely song, people want to uh, respond, and I understand that. But yes, of course, to be put on some sort of pedestal or to be called a living national treasure is... It's kind of a bit odd to me because I came from a very working class background and that was egalitarian by nature and um, you had to be wary of people who were put on pedestals, you know, and so, yeah. so one is a bit wary of the pedestal. Well, um, well, in my experience, if somebody puts you on a pedestal, that it won't be long before they, they take an axe to it with you still on the pedestal. Yeah, or digging a hole to put you down in after they put yeah. you up there. They'll need to balance it out. I think you're right. It is. But look, it, I must say, for, for a kid who was uneducated, who was... I worked in factories and stuff before I was doing this and uh, in the meatworks and all these terrible things. So to find myself accepted, you know, and to be... A friend to my people, if I could say it like that, that's something I never thought would happen. And I think it's a natural enough yearning for every child to feel they belong in this world and they are known in this world, the same as you were when you were a kid. You were known in your neighbourhood, you know, it's like that. Yeah. So, so there's a lovely side to it and you do get access uh, to people's thoughts. They will say things to you on the street. Old people will tell you things and young people will tell you things that they you wouldn't normally hear. And sometimes people say, well, how do you keep in touch with what's happening in the world? And they, meaning, oh, what do you, what newspapers do you read? I say, I keep in touch very much by listening and talking to people, you know, talking to strangers. And so it's yeah. afforded me that privilege, I think. And it's just interesting. Um, I mean, the Irish are famous for this, aren't they? My time in Ireland, I was forever talking to strangers. It was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It was beautiful. Because I'd just yeah. been in London where nobody talks to you. And, well, that's what I found at the time anyway. This was back in 1981. And um, I had a marvellous time talking on street corners. And it was a very difficult time then. I think it was the time when Bobby Sands died. And, yeah. you know, it was a sad time. It was a very sad time. Yeah. People opened up. People, a lot of people were very open. And I'd heard this about the Irish. And I was very keen to get there. And then I suddenly realised, oh, so that's what it is that's different in Australia uh, to what's in England. You know, it was the Irish component in Australian society that made it more approachable and sort of talkative and friendly. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I, lived, so. I lived in Australia for 10 years. Did you? Where did you live? Yeah. Brisbane. Where about? Brisbane. Oh, yeah, uh, I love Brisbane. Yeah, yeah, okay, you would have seen something of it there for sure. Yeah, well, it's, it, but it's funny, you know, you, if, I, if I would hear an Irish accent, uh, if when I, you know, like a full, full Irish accent, immediately, you, you know, you, you just want to go over and start talking to the person, and I'm, I'm not like that normally. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, but you just kind of yes, know that there'll be a receptivity there, you know? 
Yeah, yeah, no, I found some, I had some marvellous, marvellous moments, that sort of availability to the stranger and taking time to talk. And I, I think it's legendary. I don't know whether it's still there, but I certainly found it in great no, abundance. It is. it is. And it's funny, yeah. when, you were talk, when you were talking about the cartoonist being uh, rocking the boat in times of stability and, sta- and stabilising the boat when the, the thing is rocky, I just... Yesterday, uh, there was a big, like I live in a very remote part of the, you know, of Kerry, mm. and, you know, the, and there's houses around, but not, not many. Uh, and there mm. was a car accident outside, right outside the, our house. Um, oh. Somebody, the lady fell asleep at the wheel, car crashed, it was a mm. big bang. And suddenly there was, you know, everybody rushed out of their houses to help. And mm. it was all very, you know, like you can imagine car accident and people mm. were four people in the car and they were everyone was okay luckily and they were shepherded over to the neighbor's house and they were sitting on a, a, a bench outside and it was all very mm. tense and people were being checked my wife you know who's a first aider was checking people and whatever and then there was this silence a very awkward silence when the shock <laughs> everybody was in shock uh, yeah. the, even even we were a little bit in shock and my neighbor uh, i don't think she did this consciously but she went I thought it was my oven. <laughs> she heard the bang. <laughs> she heard the bang. She said, I thought it was my oven. I said to my daughter, is that the feckin' chicken? <laughs> and everybody started laughing. Oh, <laughs> well, even, the, even, even the people who were in shock started laughing. And it just broke yes. it. And, it, and, it, and it, it, you know, it's the same. It was all very tense. And then the bit of humor just stabilized everything and brought everybody, you know, oh, it's serious, but it's not that serious, you know. So, yeah, yeah that's, that Ar- that's that Irish thing. And that spontaneous humour, which comes from the people, as distinct from professional humorists or comedians. Yeah, you know, I, I yeah. mean, I, I love jokes and professional things, but oh, the the humour of the people that arises in the most improbable moments. People are good at it. They're good at it. Yeah. And they, uh, all sorts of people are. And yes, and I found it in Ireland. I did. Very funny. Very funny place. <laughs> and uh, I, I often. I think of that. I mean, in Australia, we are, we have a, a recurrent thing down in the south where I live, which is bushfires, and you get that same thing. You know, the terrible, catas- catastrophic things that happen, and what it yeah. brings out in people is extraordinary. Uh, so, uh, as a hum- as, as someone who's meant to be a sort of a professional humorist, uh, I must say, I'm in awe of the. Of the, of the of the ordinary humour that arises amongst human society and people in together, thrown together, etc. And uh, that thing you said before made a lot of sense about rocking the boat when it's um, too stable and the vice versa. I think it's also, for me, it's being very serious when everybody's laughing and yeah. um, and being very funny when everyone's deadly serious. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's yeah. a sort of funny, a funny uh, tendency to see the value in that. Yeah. Okay, um, next question. And these are not in any particular order um, or, or yeah. theme or anything. Um, before the Renaissance, apparently there were no artists. Uh, there were mm. just painters and sculptors and musicians and that kind of thing. Uh, sure. Do you, think it would have been, do you think it would have been good if it stayed like that? Like, is the notion of, of the artist, is it too easy a doorway for the ego to come in and, and make camp forever, you know? You know? Mm, yes, yeah, I think you've touched on something important, and it's always bothered me. Uh, well, I've observed it because, as I said before, I grew up at, in a in a time and in a class where we didn't hear of this word. We just didn't hear that we didn't know an artist. No one. It was there were no arts festivals or this sort of thing, you know, the big fuss that's made about it now. And every it's become a huge fashionable thing and it's a it's a it's an industry, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And yes, it's gone a bit mad, I think. And but one shrugs it off and doesn't matter. And there are people who are just art painters. They just are sculptors. Most of the people who who do it with a sincerity and a and a, and a love are not they don't see themselves principally as an artist but you know, you've got to declare it on your tax form, I suppose, your taxation <laughs> form. So it, there's a reality about it, but, oh, God, you're caught all sorts of pretentious nonsense when you get too swept up in that. And it's a young person's thing, really. I think most mature age artists uh, are not like that. Although, having said that, John, I do believe, uh, for instance, I was working in, in media, in a newspaper world, Amongst journalists, marvellous people, 
back then, really colourful, interesting, passionate sort of people and truth seekers and wonderful culture. And I realised that eventually it dawned on me that I wasn't like them. I was approaching all this these world events and political events with an artist's view. It, and it is a particular thing. It's a sort of a more spiritual thing, I guess. And I, I recognise that spiritual is also a dangerous word because it can attract all kinds of fraudulence and, I don't know, delusion. But, uh, but I, I realised that, yes, someone said to me, look, you are, uh, you're an artist. And I said, no, no, I'm just a cartoonist. I just, no, no, you do it as an artist. And I, it struck me that once I could accept that, that I was, I, I had, to, I, I, did, I stopped trying to be like a journalist or something, you know, a yeah. clever fellow. I, I, I realised I didn't have to be clever like that. I had a different kind of capacity, a sensibility that it had its value in the world and I didn't have to be clever. I had to just be real and intelligent, yes, and and expressive and open and vulnerable. Mm. Uh, one has to be vulnerable in order to feel things. You have to you know the world by feeling it. You know, the felt yeah. life. And and so there's a certain risk in that and a lot of people can't take it. <laughs> it gets you in trouble, but it's not what journalists do. They're more defensive. They're clever. They're craftier, and they just—they're just different people. Yeah, um, it, it certainly so, gives yeah, you a license. Sorry, it certainly gives you a license. It, it does you can get away with stuff it, that you it, wouldn't. <laughs> you can, uh, but but culturally, it's got to be recognised too. I mean, sometimes yeah. I get in a lot of trouble. Um, uh, people comment on, on cartoons. I say, no, no, I'm not writing an essay there. It's just a cartoon. I'm not creating an act of parliament or new legislation or law. It's only a cartoon. Just let it sit on the table. It's not there to be deconstructed and sort of treated like it's a bit of legislation. Mm. So if your culture can get it that, yes, you grant licence to the poet, you know, there's a poetic truth, etc. And I understand that the Irish have a pretty good record of understanding the poetry, the poetic way of life or yeah. something. Yeah. I don't know. These, yeah, and I... No, no, it's true, yeah. There's enough... Yeah, there's evidence for that, and it's very inspiring. I don't think Australia has much of that left. It's, it's not easy to be... Uh, a poet, maybe I'm just suspicious straight away, I suppose. Uh, there's a tendency, people just think you're some sort of fraud or layabout or something. I don't know what they think. So you've got to go it alone. And mm. um, have <laughs> it's you come, a bit tough. Have you come across, mm. there's a new term now people are using for themselves. They're calling themselves creatives. I'm a creative. Oh, cr Oh, right. Well, that's usually what the people who employ them call them, don't they? So get a few creatives on the job, that sort of thing. <laughs> they're like, they're sort of like machines or something. Yes, yeah, so you hear these creatives. It's pretty, pretty funny, pretty funny. Um, but uh, I think I'm too old to be a creative, John. I think I'm past that. I'm a, well, <laughs> I've, I've, actually, I've actually heard it among uh, younger people, and I think it's people who, who work in lots of different kind of, you know, they're on the internet, they're making little YouTube videos, they're writing books, they're doing... You know, a bit of art, yes. and they're like, "Oh yeah, well, I'm you know, I'm a creative." Uh, that's you know, that's just right. how they kind of label themselves. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if it's a good thing or not. I, I mean, I don't know whether the artist thing is a good thing or not. But I'm just curious to know what what you. Uh, yeah, we you know. need these sort of uh, words, I suppose, to you know, to hold meaning and stuff. And I guess a creative is a, is not exactly an artist. It can be, but it's sort of. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a new thing, and it's got a kind it of does practical, describe it. It's got a practical quality to it, doesn't it? Yes, and ranging about over a number of things, and just getting stuff done. And it doesn't quite have the the uh, implication of that struggle, which is sort of yeah, getting lost in it and uh, being a bit impractical and bit being mad. a little more. <laughs> Off, off with the pixies somewhere, yeah, you know, being yeah. otherworldly. The, the creatives are very worldly, I think. Yeah, They're very that's attuned true, yeah. to the world. I think there's something I love about the artist, as I understand that term, which is not feeling compelled to be of this world and offering something that's offering relief from this world, if you like. And I guess there, like, there is the spiritual, is it not? That, that it, is, it is not entirely of fashion or of this world. 
uh, and it is either a relief or something inspirational beyond this world and beyond the, the paradigms we normally trade in, you know. It's, yeah. it's just that yeah, out, it outside of you, which is either above it all or very much beneath it all. Yeah. So, um, uh, and very imperfect, but still, I think... The history of the artists and the writers and the poets has given such contribution to our consciousness. And yeah. I mean, all the, all the sacred texts were essentially written by artists of some sort or poets, weren't they? The Bible was a part of just a big bunch of poets, wasn't it, writing? <laughs> as far as I understand. I uh, so, 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 yeah. And all that music, where would we be without those songs, etc.? Um, a lot okay. of people say we. Yeah. So, no, no, go on. No, 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 no. I like the word okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, here's my next question. Um, yeah. I find women's skin softer than is physically possible, particularly women I love. Um, <laughs> have you found this to be true as well? And do you think it's part of the mystery of war? Oh, um. I think I understand what you're saying. It's the point where we come into physical contact, is it not? We touch this beautiful sensuality of the touch. So whether it is softer than whether we 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 experience it like that, that that's a, a lovely uh, mystery you've you've touched upon, if I may say so. <laughs> but yeah, I, I kind of recognise something there. I, but of course. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a very almost a very old-fashioned thing to say, John, which I think is very refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> that one can talk of that, that very uh, beautiful sensuality in, of just the touch and the, the sense of that, and I think. I think that matters somewhere. It's the way we touch each other too and touch the world and it, the way we are touched. But anyway, it's the point where we come, we connect, is it not, in the most primal way, the most primal, most pre-language way, that texture of of, of, of the skin. Yeah. Uh, and it's just something like, about... It's just like, say if I mm. shook hands with the man and I shook hands with the woman. A woman, I mean, I know the skin is physically a little bit softer, but... There's something else. And then particularly, like, say with my wife, like, if I put my hand on her arm or something, and I just register, gee, that, that, that is softer than is... <laughs> there's, there's something else going on there. <laughs> yes, and how would you explain that? I mean, what is going on there? What, what sort of vibration or what kind of textural... Does it reflect some the nature of woman or... Or is it what we want? We're feeling something that we really hope is true. And um, I think men like to think women are softer than they are. And sometimes they're not. No, <laughs> I no, mean, I know woman's, you mean cruel, Jesus. woman's cruelty can be as oh, ferocious as men's cruelty. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they yeah. might be as violent, but they can be as cruel. But... Um, and yes, but it's a lovely idea. And of course, the beauty of a little baby, you know, you look at the oh, yeah. face of a sleeping baby and yeah, you just yeah. see this absolute softness in your, with your eyes, you That's see right. the yeah, softness. Yeah. Your eyes can detect the softness. It's so adorable, is that. Yeah, they're similar, actually. The baby's about it. face. Mm. And it's the maternal. Kind of yeah. yeah, the maternal. Um, memory, the pre-language that we've probably lost, but there's somewhere there's a sensation of mother, is there? I don't know. But depending on who our mother was, I guess, whether we were fortunate or unfortunate. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Um, okay, another question then. Um, do, I don't know, do you miss being unknown? You know, like if you go to dinner at someone's house, I don't mm -hmm. know, if you go to dinner at people's houses, you know, it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> he's coming, yeah. kind of thing. Or... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Like yes, I was just I thinking about you be, being at a be, dinner party, right? And people saying, you know, people wouldn't ask you what you do; they'd know, you know. <laughs> Whereas well, anyone else is to kind of, yeah, go on. Mm, it's gotten like that. Yeah, look, I confess it has gotten like that, and I am aware that it is strange, and I do long to be not known or to just go somewhere freely, 
And look, I'm trapped in my own world here with that, I guess. I'd only have to go to Ireland and I'd be free. But, um, but <laughs> yes, to, to, to the extent that, that it happens, it happens a lot and increasingly and you become a bit of an object, I suppose. And people are very well-meaning and wonderful, but it's that recognition. So what is, uh, is trapped and I think this is, this is a famous situation and... Um, but then still one has to persist in being just uh, coming getting over that really quickly with the yeah. people putting everyone at rest and, and that, that's always a little sometimes it's a little challenge to to dismiss that in a kindly enough way in a courteous way and to just get around it quickly and uh, it's usually okay then everyone has a drink or two or whatever they do, and soon it all pours out because it does it does a lovely thing too people are, are trust you yeah. Um, they, they put you on a pedestal and project like mad, and then they're very disappointed <laughs> when I don't <laughs> fulfil it. But but um, but they also open up, and that's that's great. You know, they'll tell you things and tell you what they really think, and they trust they trust you. It depends what you're famous for, doesn't it? I mean, if you're famous as a football player, they mightn't open up very much. That's if true. famous as a kind of of a sort of a you know a, a, a bit of a tender-hearted. <laughs> Poet or something. Not that I'm just that, John. You would realise that if you were ever a psychotherapist, you know. <laughs> Scratch a tender-hearted poet and you'll find a, a bit of a wild man too. So yeah, because of the way they perceive my po my poetry or my work, yeah, they'll trust me to understand certain things. Uh, they can touch upon subjects they feel safe about. Yeah. They'll, they'll know I I kind of get it. And I, I usually do, but it gets a bit tiring too. I, I, I'm, I'm just one man, and there's all those people. See, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm. I have limitations on my energy. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was a little. There was a series of uh, little claymation films made of, of some of your cartoons. Were, were you happy with the result? Yeah. Oh yes and no. Um, I, I have worked. Look, it's all right. I, I, I think I, I decided when I was very young that I couldn't take everything too seriously. I take some things very seriously. But as far as my own work goes, if I get too precious and too proprietorial, uh, I, I will go mad because, um, <laughs> you know, everyone's going to stuff it up. So, and so you, you, I bear with a certain amount of that and in a pragmatic kind of way. But... Uh, no, it was all right. It's good. I've I've done so many different collaborations with all manner of people, from classical orchestras to sort of songwriters and filmmakers and stuff. And I I do accept that in collaboration, one compromises and things come out a bit strange and peculiar, but something emerges. And it, I like I love collaboration, children's choirs and all, all manner of things. A lot of my work's been set to music, which is lovely to see your work picked up and taken somewhere else. So yeah. I, I accept that things must change because you, we all need that a bit too. Right. You know, to, to not be in total control or a control freak about your work. You, basically, my work, I, I create it. It's like a children. I don't know whether you have children, John, but, you know... Yeah, but you, they go into the world and they become their own thing and you can't, you don't want to control them. They, you want them to find their way. And I think that's true of any work that one creates that it, you can't control it forever. It's going to do something that you don't understand and you just, just bid it farewell and and good luck, you know. So that's how I well, see that's it. That's what they say, isn't it? Like the, your job as an artist is to give, it, to give the thing birth, but it's not your job to raise it. <laughs> That's the world. Oh, good. The yeah, world well, raises, well yeah. said. Yeah, yeah, that's nicely said. And to walk away, you do what you can, and uh, set it, uh, set it free. Uh, I think, I think that's lovely. And move on. I can't remember so much of my work. People keep <laughs> presenting me with pieces of work. I say, I, "Did I do that? Yes, I did. Oh, all right, <laughs> lovely." And I, I, it's good not to carry it too heavily. I think, and that's just an ongoing process. And uh, it's it's not. Um, I've never entered any awards or anything like that with my work. You see, I've never had that view of my work. I've I've never tried to 
you know, all these journalistic awards and stuff. I, I've never done that. I, I, I'm not good at competing or enjoying that. That says nothing to me. If some everything's award winning nowadays, and I think, oh, when I see that, I get very suspicious. Because um, I, I, I remember reading Catcher in the Rye. Of course, everyone who ever read it remembers it, and. Um, I think Holden Caulfield goes to a little jazz club and he sees Ernie the piano player playing away and all the people are, you know, howling their approval and they're going over the moon about it all. And he, of course, Holden Caulfield falls into despair at this and he says, oh, people always applaud the wrong things. <laughs> and I think, I, I think, you know, the, the poor little embittered Holden Caulfield, um, cynical and... And disillusion, and he, yeah, but and there's some truth in that. Sometimes when you see what people go really crazy about, you think, oh, can I respect that? Not really. And um, I say that about my own work too. <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's a healthy, it's a healthy kind of sobering thing. I enjoy a lot of my work too. Sometimes I see a thing and I say, oh, did I do that? That's lovely. Yeah, oh, yeah. How did I ever do that? So yeah. I enjoy it. Other times I say, oh, my God, did I do that? That is appalling. <laughs> and so it, can, it, cuts, it cuts both ways. And what, yeah. um, it's, it's very funny. You just have to shrug a bit. And, uh, and uh, you know, tomorrow's another day. Mm. Yeah. So that's the end of part one. Uh, you can listen to part two of this brilliant conversation with uh, Michael Leonig uh, next time. I've never felt this good in my entire life. Make me some spaghetti. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we are the Argyle Pimps. So buy some drinks. We're better than you thought, but not as good as we think. We are the Argyle